Welcome. Thanks for tuning in and watching this video on uh, permaculture and how it applies to management. Um, this is April 14th and it's the National Day of Action for the Monarch Butterfly. So we'll be planting a little bit of milkweed here in the garden. We're at 18th and Rhode Island uh, Garden, permaculture garden here in Potrero Hill in San Francisco. And today we'll be hearing from Kevin Bayouk, who is the founder, co-founder of this garden, and Darcy Kilborn, who just recently uh, took a permaculture design course with Kevin, and Anastasia, who's a, another student here at Presidio Graduate School. Um, and we'll be having some conversation around permaculture design principles and how we can use them to create a better world, both through agriculture and then also beyond agriculture. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. So thanks for coming to this garden, another day in paradise here. And thought I'd maybe start by orienting us to the space. Um, this garden resulted as, uh, it was a result of a little kind of story that was published in the Chronicle. I had kind of been looking at San Francisco and taking the permaculture principles and ethics and thinking about this place, the whole city in general, and wondering about space and the kind of ostensive impoverishment. There's not a lot of space to put into productive use or to sequester carbon or to clean the air or to produce food. And I found, uh, I did a study of all the privately owned vacant lots in San Francisco, found 976 of them and uh, Chronicle published a story about it. And one of the, uh, kind of amongst a few sites, the owner of this site contacted me and he said, I read that article and uh, th that thing you mentioned, perma permaculture thing, perma what? Is that a hairdo thing? What, what's permaculture? Uh, what, what uh, I, I'd like to know what that is. I'd love to see, do a showcase, show me what it is. Um, you know, Beak probably could sell this is a double lot, 5,000 square feet on a corner in Potrero Hill in San Francisco today. Probably could sell it for, I don't know, a million and a half dollars with nothing on it. Uh, and so it's a real, I think, courageous gift to say, let's see what this, what could happen here if we turned it into a showcase of permaculture principles. So this is, the goals of the site kind of became, uh, how do we demonstrate or showcase the permaculture principles and ethics? Uh, and part of that is how do we take what was, when we arrived, a very barren, uh, nary, uh, you know, a quarter inch of topsoil. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Almost no vegetation. Uh, very little subsoil in some cases too. It's kind of a rocky site on the hill there's a lot of rocky sites like that and it was used as a bit of a dog run and maybe a right-of-way for neighbors um, and the owner had to do abatement on it every year or so because the grasses would grow tall and uh, needed to be cared for a bit as a blight and so we thought we would uh, do a few things demonstrate permaculture principles create an educational learning site for experiences like this uh, create a living germplasm nursery so that uh, we could propagate rare perennial vegetables and fruit trees and site things that will work really well in this region, this area, that are otherwise hard to come by at our local nurseries but make them available free to neighbors for their own low maintenance, drought tolerant, productive medicine, food, fiber, fuel producing gardens. And uh, another goal was to green the space to make it more beautiful and engaging and inviting to neighbors uh, to create connection and uh, community building. And so we started in October of 2008, had a permaculture class that we were teaching here in the city, kind of a class group, a design group, design team created a conceptual design and we began implementation around, uh, we did that over the summer and then around October, November we started implementation. And the way we implemented the site was because there was no soil or very little soil and no vegetation is we started sourcing material from the waste stream. Cities might have a, be impoverished in terms of the amount of space that's ostensibly available for productive use, but there's a major surplus in cities of wet as well, and that's waste. 
Uh, San Francisco goes through six million pounds of material a day. Uh, even though we divert a lot of that, a lot of that is green or organic material. And in fact, the largest export from the west coast of this continent is used paper. And so we went to the paper stream first. We went to the Whole Foods down the street. It was a new market down there. Asked them for a donation of cardboard, and we got about 10,000 pounds and 1,000 pound bundles of cardboard and actually stacked it, in some cases, two or three feet deep across the site. And then we covered the cardboard with uh, just green waste, organic matter. Uh, with the landscapes that are here in San Francisco, the typical cultural landscape management practice is what's uh, affectionately known as mow and blow, and then people remove biomass from these gardens and need to take it somewhere, and they actually pay to take it somewhere. And this great entrepreneur down in Bayview, uh, Sanjay, started something called Bayview Green Waste, where he charges a reduced tipping fee than the uh, landfill uh, service was offering. And he took the material and he grinds it up and makes it available to the community for free. Um, and so we took the landscape waste, and mounded it up on raised beds that are on contour. If you look at the beds here on the site, they kind of wiggle and curve so that when it does rain, every drop of rain that falls on the site gets held onto the site and is specifically spread evenly across the level contour lines and infiltrates passively into the, into the now growing soil. And so we didn't actually bring any soil on site. All the soil here is basically created through the action of water and microorganisms, bacteria, mycelium. And within the first year, when we were planting in it right away, as of January, we had cover crops, lots of nitrogen fixtures, and kind of a polyculture of early successional plants, and then successively added in a lot of vegetation. And now, a few years later, um, we have over 70 fruit trees and over a hundred different species of vegetables, a lot of them perennial, drought tolerant, or climate adapted. And we produce on average 2,000 pounds of food, which is all distributed for free at the free farm stand in the mission, or to volunteers who uh, come to help out on site and help steward the garden. We have had a number of events on site with neighbors who are sharing uh, food and potlucks and doing fireworks and uh, having conversations about community, uh, local self-reliance. And uh, as a showcase of permaculture principles, some of the principles that we've done here, a lot of uh, techniques and strategies, whether it's bush style pruning or perennial polyculture development or soil building or worm composting or stacking functions, you're sitting on a cob bench that actually is also a worm bin. Uh, there's worms feeding on green waste below you that's uh, producing compost that we use when we transplant vegetables and we've naturalized a lot of annual vegetables and pr produced a lot of habitat, increased the, sp the species of birds that are uh, resident in the neighborhood and uh, lots of other insect allies and other demonstrations of permaculture principles. Um, I could walk you through the site and point different, uh, again, mostly techniques and strategies but a, a lot of uh, like stacking functions and uh, even using the site for education, but today we're also going to create habitat. So we're both learning together and uh, going to add in some habitat. And so that goes, uh, the permaculture as a term, if I could, you'd be interested in hearing my take on kind of the origination, would that be appropriate? Yeah, okay. So. Uh, Permaculture first appeared in print as a term in the late 70s. Uh, it was coined by uh, David Holmgren and uh, Bill Mollison um, in a book called Permaculture One, published around 1978. And uh, yeah, Permaculture One. Well, in those, I think the the term. Yeah, more than, yeah, yeah. They were anticipating something. And the, I think I, I had a conversation with David Holmgren in 2005 when he came through North America. Um, about the kind of derivation of the term and it's kind of popularly identified that there was this concatenation of permanence and agriculture, uh, permaculture, um, with the implicit kind of idea that's been explicitly stated by Bill Mollison later that his posit or his belief system is that agriculture is the substance of all culture. If we look around us for our habits and behaviors and norms for meeting our needs for food, water, shelter, uh, community, loving relations, whatever we need, 
that uh, at the root of is, is agriculture in terms of our relationship to soil and the vegetable allies and uh, animals and the earth. And so that's kind of the positive. So permanent agriculture, permanent culture. And they were struggling to find a word. They did, it wasn't self-evident that they were going to call it permaculture. They, they dabble with the idea of saying applied ecology, you know, this idea of the study of relationships, but applying that to our life. And if I were pressed to kind of define uh, permaculture, there's kind of some simple ways that I would describe it. Um, if, if you imagine a way or a system for meeting human needs for food, water, shelter, all those things that we need, but doing so in a way that doesn't take away from the ecosystems and environment that surround us or within which we live, but actually meet our needs while enhancing and regenerating those systems, uh, not keeping it sustainable, but actually making and enhancing it. So that would be what permaculture is, is the way or the means of doing that. Um, growing food, not keeping the soil fertility a sustainable rate and not decreasing the soil fertility, but actually getting a yield of food in the soil is actually more fertile than when you started. Or getting our needs met for water instead of desecrating or destroying the biodiversity of a watershed. The, the watershed is actually more biodiverse and the water quality is improved as we meet our needs for water. Or building shelters that generate more energy than they use, these kind of things. So it's this, uh, this idea of uh, uh, not sustainable, you know, the William McDonough joke, you know, if you had a significant other and you asked about your relationship, if you said, oh yeah, it's sustainable, like, it d doesn't have that ring of like <laughs> what we want. Uh, permaculture tries to move beyond, David Holmgren wrote a book in 2004 called Permaculture Principi Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. And uh, my teacher, Brock Dolman, reminds us like the m mindset of popular culture around the world is one that seems to be scared in the city or based on scarcity. And he says, but the permaculture, the, the new culture, the emerging culture is one of looking at abundance or he, he gets up and he does abundance. You know, <laughs> right. So from scarcity to abundance, and I think that's the, the shift that uh, I, one of the defining characteristics of permaculture is that we're not satisfied with sustainability. We're really into thriving and fecundity and abundance um, going beyond just sustainable. And so it's a way or a system for meeting needs. It's also a design system. So while it's known for the artifacts, the techniques and strategies, somebody says, yeah, I know permaculture. I made a cob bench or um, I know permaculture. I saw a food forest. So the techniques and strategies are what are mostly the identifying character of permaculture. But the content, what it is, is a design system. So it's actually the placement of those elements in space and time that uh, is, uh, is what a permaculture designer um, is actually doing that, is assessing a, a place, is uh, placing elements, forgive the jargon, in space and time. And so the, in that sense, it's very broad in terms of the scope of what one does with permaculture design. It's, Gardens, yes. Farms, yes. But uh, uh, community enterprise, also community currency systems, full economies, uh, human settlements, uh, villages, uh, roads, infrastructure. Um, permaculture can be applied to any of those spheres, uh, from home birth to hospice, the whole life cycle of human settlement. Um, what we can use permaculture as a system to design all the ways in which we meet our needs. And so that makes it really broad and, and fairly inaccessible and a lot of times esoteric. So much so that a lot of my teachers call it the P word and they, they never use the word permaculture in their work um, because it uh, can be a bit of a distraction and maybe even confusing. Uh, though from a pedagogical, pedagogical perspective, I, I'm really drawn towards permaculture for the reason of uh, that, that abundance character. When I was introduced to permaculture, I was viewing the world through a lens that was decidedly dark. Uh, I could describe the world to myself as a set of intractable crises, social and ecological crises, and I, I felt a lot of angst and frustration and um, depression, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and then, thankfully, friends introduced me to some farmers up in Sonoma County and uh, the brightest people I've ever met, and they really changed dramatically how I saw the world 
and permaculture was that pathway for me to see the world not as a nested set of problems, but as a nested set of possibilities. And the solutions that permaculture provides, both the techniques and strategies in the system, the solutions are like embarrassingly simple and uh, really self-evident and fun to share. And so um, that would be trying to, so as, as from the 70s on, it's, it's evolved as a movement and it's still going through, uh, actually even right now, a really dramatic evolution in terms of the popular understanding of the term. But I would describe it both as a system, but it's also a community. There's millions of people around the world who have taken um, a training in permaculture. We talked about the permaculture design certificate training, and which provides a kind of a, a common language for these principles and ethics, which I'll highlight in another moment. Uh, and uh, community, it's a movement um, because there's projects that are demonstrating permaculture principles and human settlement patterns in place all over the world. Thousands of them, maybe even tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands soon. Uh, and that's scaling pretty quickly. So those are those showcases, those demonstrations become nuclei of the emergent culture, the permaculture. The uh, ethics, so I wanted to highlight one other thing about the permaculture. So why I like permaculture more than, say, something that's very similar, say, like biomimicry. Biomimicry is a principle-based design system. Um, and I love biomimicry, but what I love about permaculture, why I'm really what keeps me involved in permaculture, is it has an explicit set of ethics. We could argue that biomimicry has an implicit set of ethics and reverential reciprocity relationships with nature, but permaculture is an explicit set of ethics, a boundary in terms of what we do. And so every action that we're taking, we're, we're considering taking care of people, which we can describe as equitable needs being met, uh, equitable distribution of uh, resources so that everybody has food, water, shelter, these kind of things, happiness, leisure, art, expression, all, those, all the things that we want as healthy homo sapiens, and, but care of people and then care of earth as well. So taking care of people while increasing biodiversity, increasing stabilized organic matter, regularly maintaining cycles of carbon, nitrogen, hydrology, and so forth. So taking care of the earth while taking care of people. And then there's this third ethic. This, uh, and this is really, I think, what keeps me in permaculture is this uh, um, explicitly stated placing voluntary limits to consumption. So I hate the brand of voluntary simplicity, but it's embedded within permaculture as our ethic is uh, we're looking to um, fair share is the kind of the rhyming. People care, earth care, fair share, or uh, Starhawk, a friend and ally, calls it care of the future. Um, or... Um, uh, redistribute the surplus when there's a surplus created redistributed it back into earth care and people care or the indigenous peoples in North America would have called it the seventh generation seventh generation ethic um, and that's that's explicit in permaculture and that, that can get excited and enthusiastic about that because that really puts a, a pretty hard boundary about the types of things that we would design and the choices we would make in doing design the ease but one of the ones that David Holmgren talks about is uh, catch and store energy uh, and that principle we see applied uh, quite a bit in management and business, but also on a site like this. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, can you guess how we apply that principle here? Through sun power? <laughs> Got it. Photosynthesis, right? Yeah. So the translocation, if you will, the taking photons and turning into carbons and sugars and feeding the life force of the soil and all mm -hmm. the orgy of activity of the microorganisms and the amoeboids and the mycelium and the bacteria. That kind of sun, solar radiation, capturing that and storing it in, in carbon, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and that magical process is uh, something we do, which uh, you can see there's very little of the soil that's uh, exposed except when it's trampled. Trampled, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so there's almost always cover, ground cover, and that provides a, a few principle-based kind of functions. Uh, and one of those is catching and storing energy, so that we're always accumulating more and more energy, which goes back into feeding the soil because we produce no waste. So that when an nasturtium is growing out into the pathway, there's a 
few principles that come into play. This nasturtium is covering the ground, it's capturing energy. And another principle that David, uh, David Homer talks about is obtain a yield. So we can take the sweet nectar off the back end for a little sweet surprise. We can have an edible flower that's really beautiful in our salad. Obtain a yield. <laughs> we can eat the leaves, right, uh, as a salad green. A nice peppery kind of flavor. A nice salad garnish. The seed pods, which will follow the flowers, of course, when uh, green can be capered as a little fun little culinary treat, they can also be dried and ground up and made into a table pepper so that we don't have to rely on tropical spices. But all of a sudden we have a local supply chain for cookery accoutrement. And uh, now when we don't obtain a yield in that way, we can follow another principle which is produce no waste. So a common habit here in this garden is to take the energy that's been stored in the process. I mean, understanding how plants grow, most of the plants, of course, well, most of it's water. Most of all life is water. You're like 70% water. So most of this is water, but um, most of what comprises the physical part that we look at besides water is the carbon that's taken out of the atmosphere. And the green part is nitrogen. And if I harvest this and just leave it on the ground to dry, a lot of that nitrogen will volatilize back into the nitrogen cycle once it gets in the air. How much of the air is like 80% nitrogen or something? That's why it's blue. Yeah, I forget, something like that. But the, the release of nitrogen, the nitrous oxide and so forth, actually becomes a, when it is nitrous oxide, it becomes a greenhouse gas, really. Um, so what we can do, though, in terms of the spirit of producing no waste and our care of earth eth ethic, is we could take greens like this, and if I just on site, is a very small application, but I can feed this worm in over here. So having seeding that has a nice view is one function, um, but in the spirit of produce no waste principle, and another principle of integrate rather than segregate, why just have seeding when you can also have uh, the right type of habitat for compost worms that are eating, or eating bacteria really, but processing the biomass into really rich compost, which makes a good soil amendment casting for either seed germination or uh, when we transplant seedlings oftentimes, we'll give it a, inoculate the soil surrounding the new seedling with some of this finished worm casting. But we chose this site, so the siting, the appropriate placement of elements, that's a Mollison way, appropriate placement, a way of saying design from patterns to details, which is a home care principle. But this, this bench is oriented not only to accentuate a view sector, but also because it's in the shade of the only existing canopy tree on site, the oak. And the worms need a bit of shade because they like temperatures like we do. They can tolerate pretty cold and pretty hot, but it gets pretty exposed here. Petrero Hill is like a special microclimate. This side of Petrero Hill is almost like zone 10, USDA zone 10, and with climate change, it can get even more tropical, which you, you'll be able to tell by the vegetation selection. We have sapotes and um, not only the guavas, the pineapple guavas, but we have strawberry guavas and Chilean guavas and other more subtropical type species. So there's a really favorable but exposed climate here. So having a bit of shade becomes really important. Another principle into the bench, we got a so stack function, place to sit, got a view, place to give the worms the right conditions, catch and store energy, produce no waste. All the elements become this interplay of the relationships are, um, construct almost a language of the principles. And so, there's a, at first it's kind of clumsy, oh, which principle is that? But then it, it becomes a pattern, right? And the pattern, um, we can tease apart the pattern and identify all the principles at play. But this becomes a place for learning and gathering or sharing in the shade where we were talking before. But also it's built out of sand, straw, and clay. Uh, the sand and straw were excavated on site when the neighbor dug a trench for drainage along that house, so on-site materials 
is a uh, use on site materials is a Bill Mollison principle. Uh, David Holmgren would say use renewable resources. Uh, he would also say patterns to details. That's a little bit of a nuanced way of thinking about on site resources. But natural building, uh, using those resources here instead of using, say, concrete or Portland cement and some kind of aggregate mined from somewhere and heated somewhere at great gross carbon expense. This became a classroom exercise, a learning experience for people to engage with their hands and feet and hearts and minds and, and breath and energy and actually built an artifact for seating, which actually needs maintenance, which is good. It was designed for maintenance because we didn't give it a hard hat. We gave it a little capillary break with some boots so it won't totally rot away quickly, but it requires some maintenance, which is on purpose because it becomes a renewable learning experience because the human heritage, you know, almost the estimates vary, but 30 to 50% of thirds of people today still live in an earthen building. And the knowledge about how to build your own structure, build your own home, build your own barn, build your own chicken coop, build your own wall, build your own earthen structure out of the materials of earth is, I think, an important skill. It could be an important skill. And uh, that's something that we've done in a few places here with the top oven and the salamander bench and this bench here. And uh, so everything Bill Mollison writes, uh, his way of saying embrace diversity, which is David Holmgren's principle, and uh, integrate rather than segregate, he says every element serves multiple functions or stacks functions, and every function is served by multiple elements. So the comfrey, as a support species plant here, definitely is a attractor for bees as an insectary. And so we're bringing in lots of native bees and honeybees and providing bee forage. But these leaves are super medicinal. It's bone knit or it's got a couple of different common names, but it's also edible, not the tastiest, but it's good <laughs> to put it in the green smoothie. It's not like bitter, but it's got that kind of strange texture. And uh, it's also a dynamic accumulator. So the taproot of this Bakking cultivar of uh, comfrey can go down up to 12 feet. So it's going deep into the subsoil and mining manganese, molybdenum, iron, calcium, bringing it to the surface so that when I harvest this leaf, of course, the green is the nitrogen, right? and we want to capture that either in the worm bin or in the soil or in the compost in some way to regulate that cycle to make it available to the growth of the yielding plants, the char, the fruit, assuming we're not eating this or using it as medicine, right? But, which we could because it serves multiple functions. But it's also taking now I have the calcium and the iron, the molybdenum and so forth and those minerals and if I apply it to the soil on the surface, then it becomes bioavailable or phytonutrient available to the neighboring plants through the soil food web, which we keep alive by giving it cover. So there's all these nested principles kind of in every technique or strategy. And on the surface, it's like, wow, there's a lot going on, but it's actually really simple as well. Um, Can you apply that, that to management? Or have you done that in your... In different ways, in different ways. Um, I think uh, the idea that every element serves multiple functions is uh, there's a way to marry that with another principle, this observing and interactor. Bill Molson talks about the problem is the solution. Mm -hmm. And whenever I look at a business, I often look at the expense side of the balance sheet mm -hmm. or the, the P&L. Look at the expenses first. And if I think of the expenses as problems, but actually opportunities, and part of the deciding of the problem is the solution, if I could turn an expense into uh, revenue generating activity, so, oh, we have office space for our overhead expenses. Can we get office space that we can utilize to some these to other people for events or create an asset around it so that it actually flips to the other side of the balance sheet? So every element can serve multiple functions. Yes, it's an office space for us to be. That's utilizing the asset in multiple ways. So looking at, uh, so on the balance sheet, we look at the assets and say, what are the multiple functions that can be served by each of the assets? Right. And that would be one way to utilize that 
that stacking function principle, the, uh, there's another piece to that. Bill Nelson says every element serves multiple functions, and every function is served by multiple elements. This is a permaculture principle applied to management that's very contrary to management theory. In general, management theory looks for efficiency and streamlining in a lot of ways. A permaculture for purposes of resiliency and system resiliency looks at redundancy, built-in redundancy from the get-go, which is okay. more expensive. Okay. However, the pattern that I see in businesses is when we don't have redundancy, uh, especially for growing businesses. So a lot of my experience in the application of permaculture to businesses is for local, small, um, entrepreneurial, in most cases, uh, emergent, early stage growing businesses. And in that case, redundancy is essential. And that takes a couple of forms and a couple of different principles, but if we have uh, somebody who's performing a function in the company, we want to make sure that there's at least two people who are literate in that function, um, because turnover in small growing companies is really common. Um, and so we actually purposefully invest a little bit more and prepare for, cap calibrate our capacity to invest in redundancy so that if somebody drops out for whatever reason, somebody else can fill in quickly because it becomes really expensive to recreate those things. And one way we do that is through a function stack. So a lot of the literacy with the principles comes post hoc. If I look at the things that are happening in business, I can say, oh, that principle. This must happen when you hear other people doing a presentation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's that principle and that one and that one. But um, the patterns are what I look for on the, the front end, designing with the patterns. That, that brings the principles together. But like an example of the principal approach would be working with a client now in business who is, uh, we run into capacity gaps really frequently. And uh, so the need to delegate, and uh, especially in a small growing company, really common management challenge. Need to delegate. So how do we delegate? And so delegation, if we just follow the flow, if we're to delegate effectively, we need to do some kind of training. And training, uh, in order to do training, uh, there's a couple different ways to training. One is to model, okay, I'm gonna do this task or write this thing and, and have somebody observe, observe and interact, right? And another way to do it is to have that person do the task and meet coach, try that or do that differently, that kind of thing. And a third way to delegate or train is to say, read this documentation, try it, come and ask me one or two questions kind of thing. And so in the spirit of, um, embrace diversity, your principle, we do all three. But we do them in a certain sequence, so it's the placement of, of, of time. So the management tactic that we look at as pop flying permaculture business is the first heavy lift for somebody who's really busy growing a company is to document something. And that's uh, catch and store energy, it's a form of energy. So catch and store energy, to actually document your workflow processes while you're doing them is something that a lot of people are not good at. Um, it's really challenging, it's kind of a bifurcated mindset. And so, but it's that's kind of essential for effective training because it's one of the three pillars of training. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is say, bring in the person you're gonna ultimately delegate the task to, have them observe you do the task, but have them document what you're doing as a function stack while they're doing their observation. So their training gets deepened by having to observe and write down or document the process or procedure of what's going on. Now you have the cap pot store and energy of that procedure which could go enhance the training for the next person or whatever the task is. Mm -hmm. um, so we always encourage, as it's just like a function stack plus a catch the star energy, is to have, uh, to do training in that way. First model it, have somebody document it, the person who's ultimately the task to be delegated to. Mm -hmm. Then have them perform it with you giving observe and interact kind of coaching and support, accept feedback, regulate all these principles kind of mess with there. And then the third piece would, now you have this artifact of documentation which becomes a guideline mm -hmm. for that task as it's repeated. Um, so that's an example. I'm trying to apply that's these a great one. I mean, there's a lot that could share about the garden. I mean, a lot of the, some of the, the functions like say, like the almonds here, or the cherry plums, or the apricots, or the peaches. Uh, part of part of the, the functioning is uh, that you see the size of the trees are when well maintained. There's but when they're well maintained, are all reachable without a ladder. And so we do what's you know, called the Spanish orchard style pruning or bush pruning. So we actually prune in the summer, 
Um, so we devigorate the prune. And that is a, a principle that uh, I'd say obtain a yield comes to mind as the principle that would describe that. Um, it's also a balance between uh, so what principles would this be? One of the basic approaches that I use in permaculture design or in business design um, is this idea of looking for the gross surpluses and the gross deficiencies and working on the edge principle. Look at the edges, the conceptual edges, not necessarily the, uh, right. the dimensional edges or the feature edges. The edge conditions and uh, design in from there. And if we look at the city as a whole, what we have is lots of hands, lots of waste, uh, and not a lot of space. And we could let these almond trees, even though they're on, well, one of those on dwarf fruit stock, citation or whatever, it, they grown to their normal genetic height would be, you know, 40 foot tall trees and produce, you know, lots of almonds, but all at once. And I love lots of almonds, no problem with that. But it's not in for San Francisco backyards or small privately owned vacant lots. Um, it's not the great, greatest showcase. So, as a classic example, like that Santa Rosa Plum, or the neighbor's Mission Fig, every year put out like a thousand fruits, but the lovely par parrots of Telegraph Hill come and, will, and the European starlings will help them and will take something like 80 to 90 percent of the fruit. But the fruit here, maybe there's maybe more regular human presence, but also the trees are so short. Um, that the birds might take, I don't know, 5% at most of the fruit since uh, we started to go into dairy. And if it became a problem and we wanted to share the yield, we could net part of them easily. We can try and net that mission fit and forget it. That's a huge problem, or that'd be a huge challenge. And so by maintaining them small, it's like appropriate scale, it's human scale, so that we can get our almonds right at, you know, hands reach. Big already. Mm -hmm. yeah. All in it. It's that 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 polyculture that uh, embraced diversity, stacking functions, like this. Uh, the Eliagnus. This is a nitrogen fixing shrub. This gumi puts out a really tasty berry. Tastes like a uh, like candy nerds. And the nerd candy bush. Uh, and uh, so fixing nitrogen, providing a lot of good biomass, you can see it grows really rapidly. Um, but it also, uh, by interplanting it with this tree, this is the little leaf linden. The linden tree um, puts out an edible green when it, when it will come out later this spring. And the greens are like salad greens. And, uh, so perennial salad greens, so you can have for spring into early summer all these salad greens growing. And so instead of trying to fiddly grow lettuce and worry about transplanting and worrying about slugs or other insects and so forth, now you have lettuce greens. But this this will grow twice as fast by having the Eliagnus next to it. As long as we maintain the Eliagnus and actually what this garden needs is just a little bit of a pulse of energy and we're getting a stewardship kind of circle back together. We've had it different times and different stage of this garden, but a little bit of a stewardship in terms of maintaining the biomass, catch and storing the energy, producing no waste, cycling the energy, feeding the soil, and creating abundant productivity that's in partnership with each other. So these plants are in that diversity of a polyculture are actually friendly with each other. So the potato that's growing at the root of the uh, tilia cordata and the uh, garlic and then some of the onions there on the edge and it looks like somebody planted a plum tree this is the this is the thing that i'm talking about like <laughs> that plum tree i have no idea who planted that it, it, it could have been a volunteer <laughs> i have well, well this guy's tagged that would oh, be a yeah, yeah, go on, but it could be a yeah part of i had puzzle. i had to dig up a bunch of volunteers the other day yeah. they weren't there two weeks ago and all yeah. of a sudden i got two foot <laughs> tall plum trees all, or actually they were Hilarious. apricot trees yeah yeah you never know but uh, the, it's okay, you know, <laughs> just another Asian plum. The, uh, but everything here is actually playing well together in that they're utilizing resources. So it's it's a, in a sense, it's producing no waste or it's obtaining the yield. 
because uh, you get if you think about it, like a monoculture. Say this was all beets. Beets. If we had a bed of beets, all the beets, all their leaves are at the same height. All the roots are at the same depth. All the roots are looking for the same micronutrients, the same macronutrient composition as well. It's like they're in direct comp. There's nothing more competitive than a monoculture, right? Tragically, there's nothing more economically efficient than a monoculture. Economically, did I say inefficient? Ne economically e efficient as a monoculture because it becomes easy to use fossil fuel. Um, so in permaculture, agriculture, and in garden settings, we often see this idea of polycultures that are way more productive for space and they require a lot of hand tools and labor uh, comparatively to inefficient uh, to, to economically efficient, space inefficient industrial agriculture. So we need a lot more hand tools and people. Uh, but what we get as a result of that is more nutrition, uh, more conditions conducive to life, more carbon sequestration, more health, more light exercise and activity. Um, so all of these stacked, enormous stacked benefits from producing food needs. And in this case, it's just dense nutrition, fruits and veggies. But we could do staples, and people do, in polyculture. So we could do chestnuts or... Uh, there's ways to do all, all the human staples in more beneficial, life-serving life ways. And you know, all those become cliches of permaculture techniques and strategies for agricultural systems. So Ryan here is leaning on a sapote, a white sapote. You might have saw them in Maui. <coughs> yeah, and the sapote is, of course, so you that custard, that like vanilla custardy flute, fruit. So good. And uh, this has like six different cultivars, and we've had a lot of good fruit come off of this. Can you talk about yes. how you keep stuff watered, and yeah. how do you keep water on, on the property? Yes. Property. Yeah, and I think maybe if we go into this bed here, well, that would be good opportunity to address water. So, uh, the principle that we would apply with water uh, is uh, catch and store energy, right? So, or, or you could say use and value renewable resources because uh, permaculture designers are way into desalina desalination, but we prefer the, that desalinator, the, the sun. Um, 92 million miles away because it's really effective uh, and it's been desalinating water for a long time. And so we rely on the natural hydrologic cycle and rainfall patterns and see how far we can extend in a Mediterranean climate like this through careful vegetation selection and then careful bed construction um, extend our season before needing irrigation. And uh, so the strategy on this site in particular is to First, orient the beds, so the, the beds, you see how they kind of curve? They're not like just rows, they could have easily have been rows. They curve, and they're oriented longwise across the site um, to passively harvest the rainwater. So as rain falls on the site and starts to shed, according to the contour, it's always moving 90 degrees, the contour is always, water's always moving towards level, always going towards this center of the earth, if you will. And so gravity is pulling water off the site, and so it's being held up on the site because of the orientation of the beds, because the beds are on level, and so the water will always spread out and then sink in, and then run subsurface. And when it's subsurface, it doesn't evaporate nearly as quickly, and has an opportunity to rub against the roots, and of all the Bolivian sun chokes, or sun, uh, sun roots, the yacon, or the comfrey, or the cherry trees, or the... Uh, pear trees, or stuff like the, the peppers. And so all those roots get to take up the water uh, during the rainy season. But then you can see also another strategy is that there's kind of this permanent ground cover. And so the ground cover of where there's not vegetation, there's a significant amount of mulch, right? Until you get down to some actual topsoil, right? And so all this mulch cover, when we do have the rain that falls as it works its way into the soil, it's still moist down there. When was the last rain? Some time ago. But if you dug down right now, you still have moisture that's passively uh, providing the water for the, the growth for this droughty spring. 
And so we have uh, the cover, the, the canopy cover of the vegetation, which the pattern in this garden, there's a lot of deciduous fruit trees on the south side of the site, Peren uh, evergreen fruit trees, the avocado, the sapote, uh, the loquat, are on the north side of the site because they'll be casting shade during the winter. But these will lose their leaves during the winter so that we get, even when the rain starts coming in particular, when it does come, we get a bumper uh, vegetation crop in our real growing season in the dry Mediterranean coastal climate, which we have. That's our winter. Our winter is our growing season because we're so coastal, it's warm enough that we can grow just about anything and start growing it in you know, November. That's, that's our growing season here. Wow. Kind of counterintuitive because the continental climate growing season is for spring, mm -hmm. summer, and then harvest in the, the harvest moon. So here our growing season starts in November and it's really winding up right around now. But we're going to get productivity on the trees then. So we'll, what we're trying to do is evolve the site where canopy cover starts to close in. Uh, so over successive years, the idea is to get more and more perennial vegetation. So fruit trees, perennials, live, any perennial lives three years or longer, um, like the French sorrel. Uh, all the brassicas you see here, all these kales are, are tree collards or perennial kale. So this plant here, um, you can see with the long stem, is at least three years old, probably four years old, and will live for another four or five years. And we plant them one time, and, and they leaf out and stay covered. So their root systems get deeper, and they actually provide some shade over the soil so that the residual moisture that's there stays resident longer, and their root systems go lower for that passive rainwater that got harvested that's slowly moving over the site over the course of the year because it got held up on contour and infiltrated in passively. And so the more cover we have and the deeper the root systems, the more perennial cover, that means we can go longer into the season without having to irrigate. Um, first year we might have had to irrigate a bit more. Right? And second year a little bit less. The third year a little bit less. And we're progressively every year weaning ourselves off of any supplemental irrigation because we're increasing the depth of the roots, the perennial vegetation, increasing the canopy of the fruit tree species, leaving the fruit, the leaves to drop so in the winter we get all of our annual species or our natural are uh, kind of naturalized annuals because we don't do a lot of planting here. And so it's actually mostly volunteers, volunteers as in seeds and so forth that, that are most of the vegetables you see unless they're perennial. Nobody planted those lettuce. Um, those are just seeds but for the most part. That came from last year's seeds and you can see them going to seed now. So we'll have lettuce. Um, now we could, we could irrigate more, we could bring more hands on. And in our permaculture principles are care people if we wanted to uh, if the goal of this site was to grow as much food as possible, if that were the goal for food security, which is a dire need, even in an affluent city like San Francisco, 100,000 people every day go without full human nutrition in one of the wealthiest cities in the world, so it's the San Francisco Food Bank. We could grow a lot of food here, and part of us thinks about that a lot in terms of balancing our principles and our ethics. And we could grow a lot of food, the garden would look a hell of a lot different. We'd have a lot more hands here, and we use a lot more water, and it would be a great use of water. Uh, but we do produce a lot of food here, but we're also creating the stack functions of a lot of uh, educational opportunities, a lot of germplasm that can be shared with neighbors, that kind of thing. Um, the, the supplemental irrigation that we do use comes from the, our neighbor, our generous neighbor, who by written agreement has allowed us to meter the water, and he pays for a piece of it, and we pay for a piece of it. And so probably by May, we'll turn on a little bit of irrigation, and then... Uh, Progressively, will ramp up until October, and depends on the drought. We'll see um, when we turn it off. Yeah. Um, and if we have a big year of rain, if it's an El Nino in 2015, which you know might happen, I don't know if that's going to do bad. But if we if we do, depends how many fires we get. Right? If it's if we get El Nino in 2015, then we'll see how far we can go. We want to we want to try and dry farm the site and see if we can get the canopy closure on it. Uh, but we'll, I'm not sure. we'll see if we get there. But the more rich, the richer the soil is, you know, the more stabilized organic matter, the more carbon content to the soil increases the ionic bonding characteristics of the carbon molecule. So we hold more water. So that I think it's like 16 times as much water. And if you increase the stabilized organic matter content by one percent, you can increase the amount of water held by the soil by 16 times. Six times or 16 times. I might be off by order, but a lot more water. Uh, and so the water 
gets held longer, gets utilized longer, more canopy cover. So that's the general water strategy here. Thanks everyone for watching and look down below for links for more resources. Uh, we just planted some milkweed. There's some resources there on the monarch butterfly decline and what you can do to create butterfly habitat. Uh, milkweeds are needed for uh, for monarch butterflies especially to lay their eggs on and they're in severe decline right now uh, due to herbicides and uh, all sorts of other problems. So please do join us in providing butterfly habitat and learning more about permaculture. Thanks so much.